thanks a ton for coming again. Um, I see a ton of familiar faces now. Um, so this, in my opinion, is the fun part of the last three weeks, okay? So this is when we sit down and say, how are we gonna apply this? What are we gonna do? What are the take home messages and, and how are we gonna change things? Um, it's also the part, from my perspective, when I'm up here, I want you the most interactive, okay? So um, everybody's got their banana pops and put your banana pops down for just a second, right? <laughs> so two, what is two? Two winners of breastfeeding, zero, zero sugary, sugar sweetened beverages, zero sugary drinks, one, great, five, great job, wonderful job. Um, has anybody gone home and tried to apply these things yet? Yes, okay, so somebody tell me how it's going. Say it again. That's okay. It, it, so long as it's banana pop, it's okay. So it's hard. I agree with you. I mean, it's hard. How you raise your hand so you're on the spot. Well, it's mostly for me, it's the apple juice. Okay. You know, but it's really not a big deal. Like last night, it was, what do you want to drink, water or water? Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. Right. Great. Okay. Anybody else gone home and done stuff? Yeah, eating vegetables. How's it going? <laughs> okay, okay, that's okay, that's okay. That's what I brought Oh, you got suckered in, huh? Okay, so we'll focus everything to you tonight. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else tried to make some changes over the last couple weeks? Are they walking? How's that going? Good. Well, the weather's nice, so that helps. It does. But nice. I have a new little iPod that I got for my birthday, and it's got a pedometer on it. It's really cool. Oh, really? Yeah, and you can actually sync it to a Nike website. Is it you a, want to keep track of it. Is it a downloadable app, or is it? No, it's just a, it's just a feature on it. Is that right? Yeah, it's really cool. Well, there you go. I didn't know. <laughs> OK. Anybody else? Experiences? OK. Hey, we're just getting started. Come on in. Okay, well, you guys got it all right. You can do this talk now. So here it is, 2015. You guys know it all now. Um, here's just the review. This is why. Remember, you know, two is we want to start things off right, okay? So we know breastfeeding has tons of benefits health benefits for the mom, health benefits for the baby. Um, but we're doing 2015 because of obesity, because of we want people to have a healthy lifestyle. And we know if we start babies off right, they're gonna have a lifetime of changes. Um, zero, zero sugary sweetened beverages. We don't really need a whole lot in our mouths to drink besides water. We sure don't need that 20% extra calories that you get from the sugar sweetened beverages. Um, one hour activity, I mean, how are you feeling walking? I'm sort of, I mean, don't tell me if you feel bad. If you feel worse, no. don't say. <laughs> That's not no, the right that, answer. No, definitely better, more, more energetic. Plus, mindset is that I'm doing something good. Right, right. So an hour of physical activity a day, and remember, you know, you'll see later, it doesn't have to be an hour at once. You don't have to walk for an hour at a time. But just being active makes you a happier person. It makes you have, ironically, have more energy. I mean, how does that work? You spend energy and you get more? I don't know, but it works. Um, and then five fruits and vegetables. Um, we want our kids to start out with this because we want them to want the A foods. We want them to go to those fruits and veggies as their comfort food. All right, this is why we're starting off with this, and this is why I asked you guys about who's doing what or who's trying to make some changes. So how long ago did we start this idea? Almost two years. So really this is, has been in the project, in the works for two years. Um, when we started it out, and I think I said this before, but when we started it out, we all sat down and we said, okay, if we're going out in the community advocating this stuff, we have to be able to back it up. And we have to say, number one, yes, we believe in it. And number two, we're doing it. 
And the problem is, at least for me, I mean, honestly, I'm working with these two people because they're wonderful mentors and role models for me. Um, personally, I, I'm, I mean, I can do the two, okay? I mean, I talked about breastfeeding for <laughs> kindergarten graham cracker and milk break the other day. So I did the two, okay? Um, the zero, one, and five, if someone's gonna follow me around and check on how I'm doing with that, as a pediatrician, as someone standing up here saying, you need to make sure you're doing that stuff, it is not easy, okay? Um, I grew up with, um, I was raised by a single mom on a single income. She was a public school teacher who, I'm pretty sure there weren't very many other people who made less money than her. Um, we grew up on Kraft macaroni and cheese and um, cream of tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. That's what we grew up on. Um, I admire her incredibly for so much that she did for me, but nutrition-wise, you know, we needed a little work. We needed to do some things differently. Um, so I'm now an adult with my two kids saying, how am I not going to pass that nutrition habits onto my kids that probably weren't the best habits for me to have um, and that I struggle with quite frankly on a daily basis for how am I going to make those changes? Um, what do you guys think the hardest thing is about parenting? This is an easy question, huh? <laughs> Budget. Budget? That's the hardest thing? Sure. It might, might, truly might be. What else? What's that? <laughs> What'd you say, eating? Feeding. Feeding. You know, meals. Consistency. Consistency, I agree with you. What Getting else? Your children to listen to you. Okay, so having that voice of being that right. person that they listen to. Oh, so sorry, David. What else? So here's, of course, you knew I was going to tell you what I think the hardest thing is. The hardest thing I think is about being a parent is you're walking around with a mirror right there. It may be two feet tall. It grows, but it is a mirror. And everything I do, that child does back, okay? Let me tell you, when parents come into my office and they say, I don't know where they learned that four-letter word, well, <laughs> let me give you some options for where they learned it, okay? So everything we do gets reflected back to this to you as a parent from your child. And as we go through tonight, we're talking about change. But even though you brought your child, okay, because I'm going to pick on you now since you brought her, okay, even though you brought your child, where does the change truly have to start? <clears throat> oh, you got, you, he chose opposite. <laughs> the change has to start with us, right, as a parent. So I absolutely cannot be going to what I learned as comfort foods with mac and cheese and cream of tomato soup and what else? Grilled cheese. cheese, thank you very much. I cannot go with those things and expect my child that is the mirror of me in so many ways to do anything different. So when we look at ADK 2015, the first thing we have to go out of here, me included as parents, is we've got to go out of here with a behavior change plan for ourselves that we will then apply to our children. Um, when you look at behavior change models, um, there was an old study that existed um, from uh, amputees that someone, a uh, plastic surgeon, these. Poor, poor people had their arms cut off and he did a study and he decided that after 21 days um, they adjusted to losing their arm. I have some, you know, some, you know, knee-jerk reactions to that that probably not, but I don't know. Anyhow, that was the study that for a long time was behavior change and if you do something new for 21 days, you're going to get adjusted to it. Well, guess what? There's some new studies out there that say it's not 21 days. That is like a drop in the bucket. So if you go home and take one hour of physical activity, and if every day you do one hour of physical activity, by 66 days, it will become a habit. Maybe. Okay? So I don't want you guys to think that any of these things are going to change over two weeks. You've made the steps. You've started some changes. 
but you got a couple of months, a uh, couple of months ahead of you before that one habit becomes ingrained in your life. Any questions about that? All right, we'll pass it off to the next section. So, <clears throat> when it comes to the breastfeeding part, um, from a pediatrician point of view, as we work through this process with our colleagues, uh, it's pretty clear to all of us that we still have work to do on this. We've been committed to it in our community for the last 10, 15 years. We've had some success at the hospital, as you'd heard before. We try hard in our offices to be uh, technically supportive. We can get better at that. So <clears throat> we knew that this was really crucial to what we wanted to do. So then the question was, well, how does it involve all of you? Um, you've heard the concepts about why it's beneficial for babies, and probably anyone can go read some more. You don't really have to believe what we've said. You can pick up magazine articles. You can look in science journals and find loads of good stuff. You process that yourself. You make sense of it and say, well, yeah, actually, there's another good thing about breastfeeding they didn't mention. Um, and that can be an ongoing learning process for everyone here. Uh, <clears throat> used to be you had to go really look in the medical journals to find the evidence. Now you, hear, you see the books, you see the magazine articles, it's on Oprah, so you know it's true then. <laughs> so we're really asking you to be involved in a way that may be very personal. If you're going to breastfeed a baby, even if it's 10 years down the road, uh, everything you learn about it, hear about it, make sense of for yourself starts to go into that process of your own preparation. Uh, if you know someone who's pregnant and expecting a child sometime soon, if you can, you can be supportive of her going to an obstetrician, a midwife, so she gets good pre prenatal care. We didn't get into that, but that's clearly going to affect the new baby's health, the size of the baby, the likelihood that they get to uh, be born at full term. Um, <clears throat> but there can be more. So you can also encourage her to ask her midwife or her OB about special health issues she might have that would affect her success with breastfeeding. There are very few, very few actually, that truly interfere with the ability to breastfeed. But there are some, and it's fair for uh, mom-to-be to get uh, good information from her doctor about that so she, know, she knows ahead of time what might be involved. Uh, if she doesn't find success there, Point out that she could make a visit with a pediatrician in the community and talk to him or her about it because we're likely to be able to fill in some of the pieces if she's not getting it uh, at her OB office. If you know this person well, you can encourage her not to sign up for the free magazine that uh, she'll find the flyers for in the waiting room at the OB office. The magazine is uh, you know, glossy and all, but it's pretty trivial. There's very little in it that's going to actually be useful to her. And it just gets her name on a mailing list for all kinds of advertisement. Most of us don't really like that. And she gets the case of free formula the day she gets home from the hospital, which is a big, glaring message that we don't really think you're going to be successful with this. You wouldn't really want to breastfeed, would you? Here's some free samples. Well, they're free the first batch. After that, we sell it to you. So you know, how much can you impact that for someone you know who's going to have a baby? You can at least be there aware of that. If she hasn't been thinking that way, you might point that out to her. Uh, when it comes to the baby showers, uh, those are very supportive. They can be a way that we are supportive of the people we know who are going to have babies. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's involved with that is really pointing away from breastfeeding. Do you need all those bottles? No, you don't really, but that's sort of the message that goes with that. A pump? Maybe. The pump can be very helpful. They can be fairly pricey. Um, not everybody uses them. There are quite a few breastfeeding moms who have one, but it just never ended up being necessary because uh, doing it directly seemed so easy, so uh, ready. And at some point, she 
So what does she really need? Uh, well, she's going to need to have a baby to be breastfeeding, and that's pretty obvious. Uh, <clears throat> and that's pretty much it. The equipment comes as part of our biological nature. Uh, and the part that you can all do is the support that comes with that. So we really want you to all go out as supporters, active supporters of that in the community. Being an active supporter doesn't mean browbeating somebody who chooses not to breastfeed. Uh, and we actually do sometimes hear that now. Wow, somebody was really giving me a hard time because I wasn't breastfeeding. That's not what we're looking for. We really want you to be listening with ears when you hear uh, things in your circle, in your community, that might suggest that what she's trying to do is something less than uh, perfect. So if you know about it, uh, you can step into a conversation saying, well, actually, I've read this, I heard this, I went to some talks where they were, the pediatricians were practically begging us to encourage everybody to breastfeed. Um, you can be supportive of the new mom, the new family, by doing all the things that need to be done that are not breastfeeding. Uh, uh, we usually very, you know, very straightforward, encourage new parents to be very careful that their job is not to entertain friends, family, uh, neighbors, that if somebody's going to come over, they pretty much need to be coming over uh, with a hot meal, willing to do laundry, willing to go to the grocery store, not to sit down to uh, coffee and crumpets. Um, <clears throat> and. I think it's a rare mom who doesn't really need someone or at least a couple of people who are dedicated to making sure that she feels like she's being taken care of as she's doing this sometimes challenging early job of uh, uh, breastfeeding. And the early part is difficult in part because somebody just was pregnant for nine months, went through labor and delivery, which is a wonderful thing, and we go see that all the time, it can be fairly intense. Um, not to scare anybody who hasn't done that yet. And I can't claim to have done it personally, but I was there for a couple. Um, so <clears throat> you can make sure that your support of her is very tangible, whether it's uh, plumping the pillow, getting her a drink of water, um, uh <clears throat> and figuring out what else you could do that would help her feel better. I think the two winter part, uh, that gets to a level of community support that uh, we're not there yet. It really does mean rethinking the way we put things together so that m many moms who are working outside the home are able to have the extra time they might need to zip off to the daycare center to breastfeed. There are many work centers where a baby would actually be uh, part of the environment in a pretty satisfactory way. I know of some offices that allow moms who are working at a desk and a computer to actually have the baby in the cradle next to them. That doesn't work so well if you're on your feet moving around, doing retail, interacting with a lot of uh, the public. But uh, that uh, kind of change is happening. It can happen, and if everyone here goes out with that sense that, yeah, that's what we should expect. Really, why can't that happen? What, what really is the problem here that's getting in the way of it? We can make a big difference that, in that in a short time. Uh, there's the television show, uh, which is something about uh, what would you do? Well, you hear some mother who's breastfeeding uh, quietly off in a corner being uh, harassed by somebody who thinks it's inappropriate. You can look for the hidden camera, but step into that and say, well, actually, though, this I understand this is a very good thing to be doing. Um, I think it's a very appropriate thing. And yes, it's uncomfortable for some people, but actually, that's not this model problem if you're uncomfortable okay that that's real but you can deal with your own discomfort you can go uh, find something else to do or think about or look at um, <clears throat> New York State's law is now very supportive of this uh, so really there are very few settings in which a uh, woman would not be allowed to breastfeed uh, 
Jerry was pointing out that if you're trespassing, uh, you can be in trouble anyway, no matter what your behavior is. But pretty much short of that, you can be anywhere breastfeeding. It's an appropriate thing to do. Uh, New York state law would allow, allow a woman to strip to the waist and breastfeed if she wanted to without being harassed or arrested. I don't see that happening very often, but I think it makes the point. So you would do what you do for your own modesty. If your daughter-in-law, your niece, your neighbor is less modest than you, then that's just an adjustment in our own uh, sense of propriety, propriety because this is about something that's very important for a baby. I've had the opportunity to be in other parts of the world where people breastfeed as a, a natural routine, places like India where people are very modest. Uh, so at the bus station, there might be 15 moms breastfeeding. They pull the sari over. Nobody's glaring at them. Uh, people are giving that sort of personal space by attending to other things, paying attention to the kids who are running around. So it can be reintegrated into our culture. It's just the usual thing that happens that we all accept. And eh, it takes some while to get to that point, perhaps. But that's part of the change that we all need to do to say, I need to change to be more accepting of this. I don't necessarily have to uh, talk about it, but I can behave in that way. So uh, in the transition, I think that most of you have seen a uh, friend, relative, niece, nephew, or perhaps yourselves go off into a corner with the shawl and uh, you know, have privacy in that way. And uh, that is perfectly OK. But I think that we can expect that we can go more in the direction of accepting this as being just a, a normal thing, uh, part of our lives. Because the benefits will be there for all of us with healthier children. So being positive uh, in every conversation, in our body language, and in the workplaces where we may have some uh, say in how we can set things up, up to make breastfeeding a, a, a real and workable thing. Um, and if somebody wants to do it for five years, we're recommending two. <laughs> but really, that's one of those places where you can look at your own attitudes and say, why would I really feel strongly about that? If somebody wants to breastfeed for five years, is there anything that says that they shouldn't? I'm not aware of any study that suggested that that's harmful. Uh, is it damaging the child's sense of well-being, autonomy? I haven't seen that. I don't know many people who go the five years. The couple that I can think of were both children who had extremely difficult life experiences. One had had you know, multiple chest surgery for a heart condition. This was the one very positive thing between that mother and that child. <clears throat> she couldn't do anything about the surgery, the post-op, the ICUs, but she could nurse her baby. And at five, he was still nursing. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, and she definitely was harassed by family members who, if they had just stepped back for a moment, could have said, uh, uh, look at what they're putting up with. This is very difficult. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the idea of nothing on those sweet baby lips without the parent's permission is a new idea in America. I think it fits from a pediatrician's point of view. Does somebody else know that your child is peanut allergic? They may not. So they should, even on that level, be somewhat cautious about, eh, what am I feeding you? Is this really what your mom or dad would want you to get? They know you well. Maybe I should check in. If it starts with a baby when they're born, that it's mom, mom and dad, who are deciding what goes on those lips. And we can all respect that. That allows them plenty of time to get to know their own baby, to get advice from their pediatrician, to read about it, introduce other things when it's really appropriate for that child. So, but, but it's so fun to feed a child. It really is. Uh, and so the first part is the fun of breastfeeding and of, of us who can't do it aren't going to be doing it, we can be cheerful about the fact that it's happening. And down the road, we can be involved in the good nutrition of that child, potentially. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, there are some cultural aspects of that that really do require a change of mind. 
but I show her I love her by giving her cake. Mm -hmm. Yes, but how often do you need to do that? Uh, birthday? A couple of birthdays? Uh, so it starts with the first food, but you can see how that can carry out. So if you are reminded by a parent, please let me decide what goes on those lips. If you've heard that concept, it doesn't have to sting as much. Oh, yes, but, ooh, I just stepped over that line, but that's right. I really want that decision to be made by the person who knows this baby is committed to that process. And I uh, touched on the lending a hand, not a bottle. And I think that's getting better. Many a well-meaning family member says to a parent, a mother on day four, honey, you look so exhausted. Maybe I can just go get some formula and feed her for you. It sounds so logical. It seems so normal. It's very likely that the person saying that was offered that same kind of support when she was at that point. So she's mirroring what was done to her, for her, and it was well meant. But it can be profoundly uh, uh, difficult for the person who's trying to stay on course with that process. So the pediatricians have some important work to do to be very supportive of that, to increase the skill set out there. The, pub, the health department works very hard on this. There are a number of very dedicated individuals in our community who've you know, kept the knowledge base alive for decades, uh, even when it was very unpopular and unaccepted. So the tools are out there to be helpful to a parent who needs help with their breastfeeding. If you don't know how to do that, point them in that direction rather than uh, trying to step into it with uh, suggestions that come very easily but which may not be very helpful. Our ancestors all breastfed. Pretty much we're here because they did. Uh, and were they all successful? They weren't. So what did people do 100 years ago if mom's milk dried up, if mom died in childbirth and the baby survived? Wet nurse. Wet nurse. What's that? Does everybody know? So that's hand the baby to sister-in-law who's got plenty of milk. What do you all think about that? So I'd say when most pediatricians first run into that, they go, gulp? What about HIV? I mean, you could get HIV from breast milk. Yeah, that's true. But even in Africa, where in many countries, one out of three moms have HIV, if the baby doesn't get any breast milk, he's not going to survive anyway. So fortunately, we live in a community where we don't have anything like that rate of HIV. And aside from that issue, I'm completely unaware of anything about it which is unsanitary, unhelpful, uh, not right. So. <clears throat> It's just another example of where we have to go with our culture, that people need to be willing to imagine that and see, well, that wouldn't be for me, OK. But is it a wrong thing to do? Uh, pretty clearly is not. Many communities larger than ours have breast milk banks. Uh, mom who's producing plenty of extra can contribute it kind of like any of us might do with a blood donation. Uh, yes, it's kept refrigerated. It's uh, kept in clean containers. But that can be extraordinarily helpful for premature babies whose mom's milk is not adequate in terms of volume. It can be very helpful for the baby who's adopted uh, and was breastfeeding or needs to be fed. So if that's OK, then this idea of wet nurse may be something that reemerges in our culture as we move forward. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. I don't think anybody's going to ask me to design that. Um, but as a pediatrician, I'm going to be listening for that and being supportive of it and uh, be looking for any research that suggested that there was a better way to do that. I suspect, because honestly, that's still something that in my own mind uh, catches me a little off guard. I know I have a patient who doesn't tell me because she thinks I would be upset by it. Um, and her best friend told me. And I haven't made her embarrassed by saying, you know, I found out this thing about you. Uh, <clears throat> but it is perfectly expected that as we move forward, if we're being supportive of this as a culture, that we will all have to start to look at something like that and say, oh, that too. Mm, and maybe that is what we want to be doing. Um, 
So for all of you moms-to-be, you have time to think about that, read about it, uh, learn about it, observe, ask questions. For those of you who are already experienced in that or past that, you can learn and read and make sense of it for yourself and listen for those opportunities to be supportive. And uh, for those who have little direct contact with that, you can still be an advocate in your community, in your workplace for why don't we have a policy of supporting this? Why is it that you know, she has to stop breastfeeding because she has to come back to work? Isn't there way, any way we could fill in for that? Um, and in as much as any of you and all of you go out with some willingness to do that, over the next 10, 15 years, instead of having eight or nine out of 10 babies leaving the hospital breastfeeding, and by two weeks, many fewer, and by six months, many, many fewer. Uh, we might not get to 100%. We might ha not have anything like 75% uh, doing two winters, but we can make progress in this, and it will make a big difference. So um, we have cards about the law, is that yep. true? So you can find those. Uh, if you have it on your um, um, kitchen fridge, if you have it in your pocketbook, uh, in your wallet, uh, that can be a very helpful thing if you're stepping into, actually, this person has every right to be here breastfeeding. Uh, that law was worked on with a lot of effort. I think it's a surprise still to a lot of people. You mean there's a law about being allowed to breastfeed? Well, that came about because the data is there to support it. Um, there are civilized countries in which the parental leave is very workable. Uh, and uh, if it's six months guaranteed job, full benefits uh, for the mom who's breastfeeding, uh, that's just to be nice? No, it translates into a healthier workforce, healthier population. Uh, some countries allow the second six months and in encourage the father or the partner to take at least three of those months to be at home, maybe not breastfeeding, but being with the child, being part of the uh, early involvement in helping that child learn how to eat, how to be healthy. And uh, many that uh, continue to support that into the second year. So, you know, we often at statistics about how we doing and when you look at some of the things that are embarrassing about the United States here we are the wealthiest country in the world arguably to the most wonderful information wonderful technology we've got many many wonderful people living in our country why don't we do better with uh, infant mortality why do we have many many more kids uh, sick than in other uh, comparable countries with less wealth so um, <clears throat> breastfeeding is key to this and so that's why we've included it. We knew from the beginning that for many people in a community there could be a sense that yeah but I'm not breastfeeding. I hope you get the feeling from that that you can be active supporters of it. So in summary then, um, you can look at your own personal comfort level. Um, you can have an expectation that people will do it, and so that can be less startling. Uh, be aware that there's a fair amount of industry out there pushing in a different direction because they have products to sell. That's okay, but people should be informed in their ability to make decisions about what they spend their money on. Um, and then encouraging daycare working places to uh, do things that are supportive of breastfeeding. So uh, you still hear it in the news because we're still in cultural transition uh, that you know we can have ideas about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And in the case of breastfeeding, clearly we need to be changing the point of view. All right. All right. Back to me. Okay. Any questions about breastfeeding? Okay. All right. So here's the practical aspect. Um, I think the next three sections are the hardest. Okay. So zero sugar or ye drinks, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, I'm, this is sort of separated into two practical 
aspects, okay? This first slide is you have an infinite home or you are pregnant or you are planning on being pregnant or, you know, what is the practical way that you are going to avoid sugary beverages in your child's life? And the answer is you don't give them. It sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, it sounds really hard to believe, but that's the answer. You start with breastfeeding. I don't know if you guys got that message yet, but you start with breastfeeding. And the second thing is you truly don't have to go to a bottle from breastfeeding. Unless you're pumping, you have to go to work, you have to feed them from a bottle. Um, our family has a term, you guys didn't know this yet. <laughs> Our family's uh, motto is boob to pizza. Um, pizza is not really what we advocate here in this discussion, but the idea is that really, really you can transition pretty well from breastfeeding to table foods, to an open cup. Um, sippy cups, I don't know if you guys have noticed, have sort of transitioned to sort of a semi-bottle lately. Um, the problem with that is it is a comfort behavior for children to carry a sippy cup around, to carry a bottle around, and just drink, 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 drink when they really don't need it for thirst purposes. If you have an open container of water that your nine-month-old goes to, crawls to, please mom feed me water, um, and it's just sitting there and you teach your nine-month-old to drink out of an open cup, they're going to drink for thirst reasons, not for comfort reasons. And that's going to be a huge difference in what they go to for a beverage. Um, if your baby does have a bottle, I mean, a lot of us are working moms. The majority of us are working moms. The majority of us, if that's even if it's breast milk in the bottle, um, they're going to have a bottle at some point. And let me just say that bottle needs to go away by 15 months old. Gone. Gone. Um, and that does a huge, huge lifestyle change for babies. So that's if you haven't started, okay? So if your baby has never had a sugary beverage on their lips, don't start. The only reason I ever advocate for any type of juice, and it's in a very limited amount, is for constipation reasons because that fixes it. Okay, here's the second part. I feed apple juice every night for dinner, or I feed, that's just, they have Gatorade at their sports um, event, or they have um, Coke in the Happy Meal, or they have, you know, whatever it is, they're already acclimated to getting a sugary beverage. And what do you do about it? Well, the answer is the first thing is you have to make water available, okay? So if it's, um, if it's, easier to grab a soda off the bottom shelf of the pantry or if it's easier to pour Gatorade out of the pitcher or if it's easier to just grab a Gatorade, they're going to do that instead of drinking the water. Um, <clears throat> I looked at some cost issues because one of the questions we had last time was cost. Um, practically, how do we do this? This is how you put money into some fruits and veggie stuff. This is how you put money into other areas is by cutting out the sugar sweet beverages. Um, I looked at, um, I essentially looked at a, a big distributor and said, okay, if someone went and bought a case of, I think it was orange, what's the orange soda? Crush is what I grew up with, but that wasn't what it was. Sunkist, okay, that's right. Okay, so let's say they buy a case of Sunkist. Um, it'd be, um, and let's say the family drank two a day, which I think is pretty unlikely. I think if you're drinking sugary beverages, it's a ton more than twice a day, and it's probably a ton more than around 75 cents a day, which is what I looked at as 75 cents a beverage, which is what I looked at for this big case if you went and bought it from Sam's Club or Costco or something. The point of all that is, is it quickly, two a, two a day adds up to about $500 a year. So that's, that's an awful lot of money that if you're just going to the tap and you're filling up the water, you're filling up the pitcher um, with tap water, that's an awful lot of money to put into fruits and veggies or something else that you want to do. So the practical tip for how do you do the budget, how do you take it home and make this happen, 
the answer is you cut out the sugary drinks, okay? Um, the last very practical thing as far as a um, transition from I'm used to drinking Gatorade, I'm used to drinking um, Crystal Light, sh um, Gatorade, sugar soda, what are some other things, Sunny D, um, what are some other things you guys see your kids drink? Kool-Aid, of course apple juice, Mountain Dew, yes that's a big thing. Yep. So not getting the calories, right? So that's a big bonus. You're not doing those 20% extra calories, but probably doing some stuff and acclimating him to a taste that he doesn't need either, you know? So I think that's the step in the right direction, and maybe that's one of those bridging steps that people need to do as far as... Uh, some uh, questionable artificial sweeteners too. Yeah, I mean, I can go on forever about that. So, I mean, so, so maybe that's a transition step, but the goal is water. Um, so one of the other sort of, sort of things, practical things you do is you say, hey, you're thirsty? Go get some water first. Drink a big eight ounce glass of water first. If you're still thirsty, I'll give you a little bit of juice. And that's that transition. It puts the priority on the water first. This is what we've talked about up to this point. This is not us going out and telling our kids to stop drinking juice. We can't sit down at breakfast and pour a big glass of apple juice and say you can't have any. I mean, we can't do that. And in the perfect world, if this is going to work, it's going to be a family approach to this. If you've got older kids, you sit down with them and you say, hey, what do you think? I mean, come to this lecture tonight. I want to tell you what. So you sit down with them and you say, hey, hon, I heard this thing about how these sugary drinks are not the best thing. How can we apply this to our family? And if you engage your kids and you say, help me make these good decisions and help me make these changes, um, my daughter right now is big on don't waste water and I cannot put soap on my hands and leave the water running at this point because she tells me to turn the water off. So I promise if you engage your kids, they're gonna make, make it much easier as a family. The other idea is, okay, you guys remember that um, video about the sugar in the drinks and how many, 16 packets of sugar that this, this goofball, whoever that was that they got to do that video was pouring into his mouth. Um, the idea is, here's your sugar for the day, pick it. Where do you want it to come from? So if you're already in that habit of sugary beverages, just switch it and say, okay, hun, here's your sugar for the day. Do you want to drink your sugar? Do you want a small bowl of ice cream? Do you want a cookie? Do you want, you know, what is your treat? Or do you want fruit? <laughs> fruit or vegetable or, um, but <laughs> perhaps, um, you know, they might, they might make a choice, if they're given a choice, a lot of times they make a good one. Um, and then as another transition time, you know, sodas have come out with these little bitty drink cans now. You know, so if you just think that there's a chance the world's going to end if you don't have the Coke, um, you know, just downsize. Um, um, you know, you guys are going to go out of here with more personal information about me than you've um, anybody ever wanted, probably. I grew up partly in the South. Um, does anybody know what drink is in the South? Sweet tea. Oh, sweet tea, that's right. I didn't even think about that. I'm scarred by another childhood experience. That's why I didn't think about that. Um, it's Coke. So part of my transition up here is nobody drinks Coke, they drink Pepsi. I mean, talk about a struggle for someone who was raised in Georgia. Um, so, you know, my, we did a, my family, we grew up and we did taste tests in the grocery store. You guys ever remember that when Coke and Pepsi were doing the taste tests? Well, I failed. I picked Pepsi in Georgia that was the best taste test. And when we go to family reunions, nobody talks about that I'm a doctor now. They talk about that I failed the taste test. So anyhow, the other way to break the habit is just make it fun. Put some lemon in it, put some lime in it. Um, where are these at? Sam's Club or something? 
Um, the idea is you pack some stuff in and it leaches out. Some leeches is probably not the word you want to drink, <laughs> but it does get some uh, other taste into it. The other option is seltzer water. I mean, you know, if you really got to have that carbonation, um, you know, I got a problem with carbonation as far as calcium and bone development. Um, but if that's going to be your transition to plain water, okay, do some seltzer water. Any questions about that so far? I think one of our hardest things uh, that we face as a parent is guilt, okay? So we work all day, we come home, we want our kids to be happy for that brief amount of time that we're there. And if we're telling them no, they can't have their juice, no, they can't have their soda, no, they can't have their cookie, all this stuff, then that time that we spend with them can feel very negative to us. And short term, it's much easier for us to say, here, have this that makes you happy, but it's temporary. So as parents, it's our job to say, what is, their what is our long-term goal? What do we want as their health long-term? Um, we need to, as a community, you know, we're all here. We've all really committed to this. We've been here for three weeks now. We need to go out now and look at our community and say, if I take my child to a playground or if I take my child to an activity, where do they go to get water? If they're at a sports event, where's their water? Um, if they're at school, what's the vending machines at school? What are they doing? What is their opportunity when they're away from me? I'm teaching them as best I can, but what, what can we do to improve their ability um, to, to get their water um, easily? Um, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, Jerry, can you talk about that just briefly? Um, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was passed about six to eight months ago, still in transition, but one of the things, one of the many things it focuses on are <coughs> changes in the school meal program. The two things that are, are definitely coming, actually three things, uh, one is low-fat milk for all students. We do pretty well up here in Clinton County, except for one school, I'm not going to mention any names. Um, the other thing is water, and the water has to be available for, for children. So they're working out the details of that, but starting in September, some of the uh, schools are putting water on the line with cups, others are suggesting uh, putting water, they're, they're actually installing water fountains in the classrooms. And the third part is they gotta raise the school lunch prices. They have to what? Raise the school lunch prices, it's a federal mandate. So that, that's the other part of it, but there'll be more to the good news. But the good news is the water. Um, Jerry uses, I'll put her on the spot again, she uses this great um, phrase that um, is that the parent is the gatekeeper in a lot of ways. Am I using that correctly, that phrase correctly? Um, here's the idea. If you've got someone under 16 in your house, there's a good chance they are not bringing the food into the house, okay? Um, so who's driving to the grocery store? Who's going through the drive-through? Who's going through? It's the parent, it's us, it's me, making that choice in the grocery store about what I bring home to my child. So it's the, you know, rethink your drink. Okay. Was anybody off today? David began and I were off today, so we were outside all day today. It was hard to come in. Anybody else outside today? Um, so here's the idea about activity. You guys remember the guy pushing the lawnmower from the four-wheeler? Um, it's just something that now we have to rethink how we do. How are we gonna incorporate activity in our life? Um, Activity is not all at once. So it's not Melissa going for a walk for an hour at a time. Um, it is, and I'm picking on you now, but it's Melissa saying, I'm gonna walk for a little bit now. I'm gonna go out and weed for a little bit now. I'm gonna vacuum now. I'm gonna do whatever. It's not, it's just being active. Um, Remember that activity is developmentally appropriate, okay? Um, you know, I talk about my kids a lot. 
Um, my oldest daughter makes the cat do jumping jacks. Um, that is not developmentally appropriate for that cat. And he is, uh, he at this point is very sorry we adopted him from the Humane Society. Um, but so you have to do developmentally appropriate stuff, right? So for the baby, it's tummy time, it's getting down with the toddler, it's crawling around, it's um, climbing over stuff, it's climbing under stuff, it's putting um, two chairs back to back and putting a sheet on it and crawling through like a cave over and over again. Um, activity does not mean you have to be Jillian Michaels or whoever, um, you know, you don't have to be that person, you just have to be active. Um, and again, it's not all at once. You got all day to do it. Um, same thing, if you're moving, it counts. That's, that's what I look like when I have. <laughs> Here's the practical side to activity. And I, I think out of, I think this is the hardest thing to adapt in some ways because it's, it's easier to change what's on the plate than what our routine is as far as activity, I think. Um, so the practical part of activity is number one, you go home and say, am I active? What parts of my life are active? And number two, how am I gonna change it? And you have to sit down and you have to have a plan for it. Um, you have to role model those behaviors so again, I can't sit in the recliner and say, go play outside. I mean, that's only gonna work short time and it's gonna make them bitter about me later. Um, your family time has to center around movement. So, you know, if you're done with dinner, what are you gonna do? You go outside, right? Everybody puts their snowsuits on and you go outside or you put your, you know, you just, you have to make your family activity movement. What do you do on the weekend? Well, we're in you know, a wonderful area for hiking. Go hiking. Go for a walk in the park. I mean, but the point is, if you take nothing away from the activity of one hour a day, you gotta make a plan for it. And you've gotta sit down at the beginning of the week or sit down at the beginning of the day and you say, this is how I'm gonna incorporate activity into my life. I, I was gonna change the title of this slide. <laughs> That's okay. I wanted to say off the competition or something, but um, I figured Jerry thought it was a little harsh, so. Um, <laughs> but part of, part of looking at activity is figuring out what is the competition? Why aren't you active? Um, the biggest reason has to do with LCD screen, I mean it has to do with TVs, it has to do with computers, right? Um, it's pretty rare, I get it sometimes, but it's pretty rare that I have a patient come in and the mom says or dad says, yeah, I can't get them to do anything but read all day. I mean, it, I have those patients, <laughs> but it's pretty rare, I know, that's a, I mean, it's pretty rare. So most of it is screen time. Um, you know, the two that we put in for two winners of breastfeeding, other places in the country that have done programs similar to this say two hours of screen time. Um, you know, it's, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, from a practical standpoint, there are a couple things to do. Number one is you take the p TV out of your child's bedroom. Um, for many reasons that I could do hours and hours of lectures on, um, but that is the first thing, if nobody does anything else tonight, you take the TV out of your child's bedroom. Um, the second thing you do is you have screen off times that you have in your house. From seven to eight at night, for example, there is no screen on in the house, no computer, no TV, um, no Nintendo or whatever it is now, I'm so behind now with Nintendo, but whatever the little thing is here that people do all day when I try and talk to them in the office. Um, so, so none of that for one hour a day. So just start out, one hour a day, no screen time, no screens on. Um, the other thing that a parent told me the other day that was one of those sort of life-changing moments for a couple parents as I've passed it along is she has her children bank hours for screen time. So if you wanna watch your favorite show tonight that's 30 minutes or an hour or something, I've gotta see that timer 
go up to an hour of activity before you can sit down and watch TV. So she does it a little bit different. If you want to do screen time, you got to put the activity in beforehand. And you know, that works great for her family. I've bounced it off some other parents and, and it really seems to be a very practical way to set the timer. How long are you active? You were active for 15 minutes. Okay, you just earned 15 minutes of screen time. The interesting thing about that is the more active kids are, the less screen time they have, the less screen time they want. Does anybody know about the Saranac River Trail? Or, okay. um, so there are things that are happening in our community now that need our voice to say, this is how we want our community to be. We want roads that we can bike on. We want roads that we can walk on without worrying that we're gonna get clipped by a rear view mirror. Um, we want all these things and we want our towns to plan it and make a decision based on an active lifestyle. Um, there's some really neat ideas about um, schools that are getting away from competitive sports, um, which, you know, it, again, if we're going to talk about how I grew up, I grew up with you make the varsity team and you're the starter. I mean, that's how I grew up. But that's not, that's not the reality for the majority of people and that's not necessarily the healthiest way to live. Um, there are some school-based non-competitive intramurals um, and the idea is that everybody has an active lifestyle. Everybody has activity as a team, as a community. Um, instead of trying to be the next Olympic athlete. And again, there are some things that do not count. <laughs> okay, well, I get wired up here. Hi. Okay, this is the end. And this is fruits and vegetables. This is everybody's favorite part, right? Who said fruits and vegetables, right? You did. That's why you're here, isn't it? Fruits and vegetables. You're eating a banana. Okay, so you're doing well. Um, the reason we focused on this is because a lot of people, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. How many of you have heard the saying, five a day? So that marketing worked. How many of you eat five a day? Uh, a few of you less hands. Well, the marketing worked, but the message didn't make it to your dinner plate and to your house. What happened was when we did the five a day plan, we, set, we didn't want to scare people. They changed it now to more matters because we realized it was almost a losing battle because five a day is really a good plan. What we really want people today eat every day is more like nine or 13. I mean, there's a lot. If I said to you, you have to eat 13 fruits and vegetables a day, oh my gosh, you would leave, right? You would leave, you would leave, right? So we don't want to scare people, so they changed the whole marketing campaign to say more matters. So that's the take home message. Whatever you're doing now, more is better. So if you're only doing one a day, two is really a lot better than you were doing, right? So let's think about that. Let's think in terms of the small steps and have a little bit more. And I wanted to give you some practical ways to do the fruits and vegetables. And I like stepwise things. So here's step one. Step one is to fill half your cart with produce. So when you go into the grocery store and you got your grocery shopping list and you got your cart, where do you go first? Okay, you're going to go to the, because it's on the perimeter of the store. What's in the middle of the store? We all know the other stuff. Some of those aisles you can skip. If you fill your cart with half produce, you're on the road to getting some good, some good nutrition in your diet. Now, the problem is, what we heard last week is people said, we can't afford that. I can't put five, all those fruits and vegetables in my cart. We can't pay for that that costs too much, so we're gonna talk about that. Because one of the ways we are encouraging people to do is to go through CSAs, which is tonight's prize in a few minutes, and farmers markets, produce stands, local produce stands, because sometimes it's cheaper to do it that way if you don't grow it yourself. If you know somebody with excess zucchini at the end of the year, you can get some of that, you can put it up. 
But one of the things people don't think about is they think you have to do fresh produce. And fresh produce is a really good thing to have. I'm not going to dispute that. But you can eat frozen vegetables. You can have canned vegetables. It's really OK. You can have canned with maybe a lower sugar syrup, maybe packed in their own juice. So the point is to shop within your budget and you look at what's seasonal. So if you're buying the stuff that's imported from who knows where and coming across the country and it takes two weeks to get here, your frozen option is probably more nutritious and it's a heck of a lot cheaper for you. So you work within your budget to get that. So it doesn't have to be just the produce from the fresh. You can go to the can and you can go to the frozen vegetables and fruits. So think about that and use those as an option for you because it all counts because more matters, right? Whoops, back I go. Okay, step two. It's the same thing we talked about with the water. If you open the refrigerator and the Gatorade and the Coke is there, what do you take? It's the same with the produce. If you go home from school and you have school-aged children and they're 10, 11, 12, and they're maybe getting off the bus and they're going in the house and they're getting their own snack, what's available on your counter? If they open the cupboard and there's a bag of chips, well, guess what? What are they going to eat? If they look on the counter and there's a bag of apples, they may eat that. Better yet, if they open the refrigerator and there's baby carrots sitting at eye level of their height, they may actually choose that. It's a matter of convenience. Sometimes people won't open the bottom shelf, you know, the little drawers where you put the produce in? It stays there. You pull it out, it's got mold all over it because nobody wants to take it out. Nobody's going to wash it, right? So if you want people to do that in your household, sometimes you have to do that yourself. You might have to rinse the grapes off and put them in a drawer or in a, in a bowl and put them in the shelf, in the refrigerator, so they open and they go, oh yeah, there's grapes, I'll eat those. And that's the way it works with a lot of people and a lot of things that we eat anyway. So when it's in the eyesight and you want to encourage it, you make it available. The other thing to do is let the kids help you. So if you do have young children, have them help you prep that. And the picture we have there is actually a picture of one of the cooking classes we do in the summer and this is to a couple of our students that were actively involved. Kids can learn how to cut vegetables and when they do it they actually like to eat them and they will say gee I never had this before but they usually will try it. So make it convenient, encourage them to eat it, enlist their help and if you want to be convenient it's going to be costly. You can buy pre-shredded carrots, you can buy pre-cut potatoes. That falls within your budget and what you can afford. So if you want to eat that and you want to go convenient, you can choose those things, but it costs a lot more. Number three, same theory that we've been talking about. I can't drink my sweet tea and tell my child to have a glass, go drink water and get me a Dr. Pepper while you're at it, okay? You can't do that stuff. So what are we doing? We're modeling behavior. This is, I don't know if you can read the bottom, it says, the woman serving broccoli. No, I haven't heard that the FDA has taken broccoli off the market because the father is saying, no, broccoli. What message is he communicating to the child? How many kids are gonna eat that if their father doesn't? So you need to enlist everybody and you need to role model it. If you hate Brussels sprouts, you will never touch a Brussels sprout in your life. You will not put them on your lips. Maybe you shouldn't be serving those alone as the only vegetable. Maybe you should have another vegetable so that you can choose the other one, but you can offer that to your child. But you can't expect them, you eat your vegetables and I'm going to have this plate of lasagna. It doesn't work that way. So we have to role model. And I put this on the bottom because I, you know, you grew up with whatever you, I grew up with this. Do as I say, not as I do. I mean, I don't know if any of you have heard that. I, that's what we grew up with. Do as I say, not as I do. So in other words, this is okay for me, but not for you. And what do you learn about that? You want those forbidden things. It was Pepsi. Pepsi. I'm a Pepsi. See? Pepsi. Pepsi about. Cola. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Number four. Start the veggies early. 
developmentally appropriate. Obviously, nobody would give this carrot to this baby. This is a joke, all right? But what we could do, you give them foods that are developmentally appropriate. When they're developmentally ready for foods, it's okay to give them vegetables. It's okay to mush some peas with a fork. Those kinds of things, you don't need, well, I could go on about that. You don't need baby food. Nobody needs baby food. You can mush it with a fork and make it developmentally appropriate. But give them the vegetables, develop the taste, and it takes a long time sometimes. There are, I'm too fast for this, sometimes, and this could be even more, there have actually been many studies done on this to say how many times do I need to give a child a bite of vegetable before they'll accept it? How many of you hated something as a child and then when you grew up you go, oh, those aren't so bad, right? Okay. Was it Brussels sprouts? Because that's what happened to me. I hated those things. Okay. Now I do because they're cute little cabbages, but I never did. So people often at least 10 times, you can give a bite to a baby who's ready to eat and they'll go, <coughs> and then you, your thought is, oh, they hate that. And you never give it to them again because they hate it. And then you say, oh, don't give that to Johnny because he hates that. And poor Johnny has to go until he's 40 years old before he can eat that broccoli because nobody gave it to him because they thought he hated it. So a 10 time minimum of vegetable introduction and fruits, I, and I say vegetables because those are not as well accepted as fruits for young people because they're just not as sweet. The other thing is what I heard the other day from somebody was that um, children sometimes will, will gag, they'll have oral problems when you give them something. People feel like you have to say, you need to eat that, you have to try this, you have to do it. And this is one of the other things, not just the gatekeeper I say, but this is the other thing I like to say, is whose responsibility is it to eat? It's the parent's job to buy the food and bring it in the house and for young children to prepare it. It's the child's job to eat it or not. We don't want food battles because if you sit at the table and you are in a battle about those peas and you have to eat them all before you leave the table, you're gonna have a terrible, terrible memory about peas. And when you get out of the house, you will never eat another pea in your life. So we offer foods, we say after a reasonable amount of time, guess you're not hungry tonight. And this much, we're not talking a whole lot here. We're talking a little piece of meat. What is the biggest part of your grocery budget? Meats? If you're only serving this much, do you think you might cut down on it? So right off, there's another one of those savings, getting rid of those SSBs and saving that. Somebody else had suggested, had asked about portions. I don't remember who it was, but you know, do you have to eat four cups of green beans? What is a portion? And really for children, and I'm talking young children, we're not talking a lot. Their stomachs aren't really very big. So a, a rule of thumb, if you wanna take home a rule of thumb, is a tablespoon of food per year of age, all right? So, two-year-old, we're talking, you know, it's, it's tiny, we're only talking. So when you put mashed potatoes on their plate like this with a scoop of gravy, do you think they're gonna eat it all? They're gonna go, oh my gosh, I can't eat all this. And then the parent says, well, you gotta eat your potatoes because it's on your plate. Well, we give them too much because it's our perception. So think of small plates Think of portion sizes and think how much money you're saving when you do that. And another way to incorporate more produce is try to think about every meal you eat and every snack. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, throw some lettuce and tomatoes on a sandwich. Think of the things you do and how you can have fruits and vegetables at every meal and at snacks. And that's another easy way to do it. The other thing, and this is hot off the press as of this morning, we actually priced some things at one of the local grocery stores, which I guess is obvious because of some of the pictures. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to get at was sometimes we think that, it, and it, there really have been a lot of studies that show it, it is expensive to eat in a healthy manner in this country frequently. But one of the things I wanted to point out were these were typical, and I did this just for you, the macaroni and cheese, because I know you love that. Um, <laughs> 
So the Kraft macaroni, four boxes of that, which sometimes if you have a big family, they're only, you know, there's these skinny little boxes and like my 16 year old could eat the whole thing in, you know, a second. So four boxes would cost $5.96. But if you did the quick, and I'm thinking quick here because most people don't have a heck of a lot of time to make foods. Quick minestrone, uh, some whole wheat penne, some frozen, those are your frozen vegetables, so you didn't have to get the fresh stuff, and throw it in with a can of soup and some broth or some water. That costs three seventy-seven, and you got a lot more to feed people than you did with the box macaroni and cheese, and it's a lot better for you. Here's the other price, frozen pizza. Again, teenager could polish that off in 15 minutes. $4.19. The alternative could be the fa Fast Fiesta dish, which I kind of made up as I was typing this, but it could be called that. So it's canned beans that you can rinse, instant brown rice, and uh, frozen green, um, I think I put green peppers and corn in it. If you mix that in a pan and you cook it, it takes 10 minutes. It costs $5.35. It's a little bit more, but it's going to feed a lot more people than that pizza did, and it's a lot better for you. And for snacks. Now, sometimes if you want a Snickers bar, you have to have it. Okay, you just have to. You can't, or you can get the little ones. But if you have the choice, and look at the price here, 79 cents versus 72. And what's gonna keep you fuller and be better for you? And the same, the Fryhofer's cookies is 12 ounces, the box. Okay, some people might eat the whole box. Um, the bananas are 59 cents a pound. That's about two and a half pounds. So you can give several people a banana, and you could probably give several people a couple cookies too, but here's the choices. So it's a matter of choices that we're making at the point of sale, and it's really kind of rethinking the way we're doing things. So again, we want to bring the theme back to supporting our community, and the ways we can do that with produce is buying local, if we can. It helps support the local farmers, it helps, it, and if we want to grow a garden, do it. The other big issue is money in school budgets, which isn't going to happen this year, I don't think, um, <laughs> for produce. But I'm sure many of you are aware that the school budgets do not include money for food, that those, the food that the people are served in the cafeteria is all self-supporting through the cafeteria. It's not included in the school budget. It's we never put extra money into that. So if we want that in our schools, we've got to start asking for that. So be the squeaky wheel in your system. And wherever we are, think of how you can support that concept. So if you have to bring a food dish to a school event, be the person to shake things up a little and bring a fruit platter, you know? You never know if that, what's going to happen with that. And that's all we have to say tonight. But what we'd like you to do is walk away after all these, these three weeks, we told you what this means with 2015 and why we think it's a really good idea and some easier tips to do it. We'd like you to think of even one of these things you can do and certainly be an ambassador for us of spreading the word of what this means.